What's up, baby? What's up, man? Just another Tome Tuesday. Yeah, dude. Devotional. Yeah, man. Um, just for anyone just tuning in, this is the Tome of Chaos podcast, and we're trying to crowdfund a religion that doesn't suck. Yeah, dude. Uh, get a bunch of people together, talk about religion, do cool shit. Mm-hmm. Uh, we've been described as an off-ramp um, by Walter, uh, a place where people can find solace and friendships, uh, after they leave spirituality. Um, I don't think anyone ever becomes unspiritual, you know, at a certain point, maybe, but you know, we talk about a lot of cool shit on here. Yeah, man. Um, so feel free to join us, uh, for all the Tomies that have been with us for a while. Thanks for sticking around. Yeah, we appreciate you it's, guys. I would have never thought that we would have gotten here, you know? Oh, um, fuck no. Like, I know some listeners by name and communicate with them. Mm-hmm. Like, that's fucking really cool. Super tight. Um, So, uh, yeah, man. How, Walter, how you been, dude? I've been good, man. I um, This will be a while after at this point since, you know, episodes come out a little later but i was on vacation in nashville north carolina beautiful uh you know it's quarantine so we didn't fucking go out much or do a whole lot but we're up in the mountains in an airbnb watching the fucking fog roll over some shit eating takeout are you the type of person that looks out at that scene like the mountains and shit and you're like Dude, so beautiful. That's my home, man. Really? I love that shit. I never look at view like things like people would be like, "Isn't this view so beautiful?" You and don't, you don't get it. No, I don't. I'm just like, eh, whatever. I it's didn't. A I didn't when I was younger, but these days, I'm like, I don't know, dude. I just found out. It's like I think it's the fear of losing the Earth yeah. and its beauty that's made me learn to appreciate it. Like yeah. with the global warming shit and, uh, you know, all that. I'm just like, man. I like this stuff. I'd be sad if I couldn't look at trees anymore. Yeah, dude. Maybe I need to think about that more. Yeah, dude. Just like shit might end. Shit yeah. Might, like shit is going to end if we don't change it. Dude, you'd be... Think about if you never saw another fucking weeping willow, dude. That'd weeping be willows are beautiful. Right? Yeah, I don't look at them now and I'm like, well, I just walk by and I'm like tree. Yeah. You know, yeah, but yeah. I think that if I think that way, I'll fucking... I'll get right to where you're at. Hell yeah, dude. I Hell hope yeah. you do. What about you, man? How you been? I'm doing pretty good. Um, I got, so we talked about this earlier, but um, I got a cat. Yeah, you did. The cat chose us. You betrayed me, but you got I it. know, dude. So <laughs> I forgot that you were allergic until literally I opened the door and I was like, I think Walter's allergic to this. Yeah, bro. Um, And I, so I fucked you. Are you doing all right? Yeah, I'm doing fine. You uh, haven't felt any symptoms? No, I'm pretty good unless like I straight up get like a cat hair on my yeah. eye and then it looks like I got punched in the fucking yeah, face. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'm so, doing good. So do you do you know what we named you know what we named the cat? No, I don't. Uh, well, her name is Cake. Okay. Cake the cat. Nice. And from Adventure, Adventure Time. Time dude. Yeah, dude. Fuck um, yeah. So she picked us. We thought, uh, just showed up on the fucking doorstep one day, and Sarah was like, we got to take this vet to this cat to the vet. Uh-huh. Uh, I think she's sick. And I was like, if you take that cat, you better just get a fucking litter box because now it's ours. Right. Like, I'm not paying. I can't pay this cat's bills, dude. And yeah. it just live outside, you yeah. know, like, um, so brought her in and uh, we take her to the vet and she's going to be all right. Everything's chill. Hell but yeah. she is a, a boy. <laughs> oh, she is a boy. Okay. Yeah, dude. Uh, so we can't tell a fucking, you know, so Sarah and I were talking and she was like, I just think it's hilarious that we base this whole cat persona off of the gender twisted Jake, you know, from uh-huh. Adventure Time. Uh-huh. And she happens to be a boy, you know? So now we just have this like gender fluid cat because we don't, we keep (laughs) fucking up and calling her, you know, her a her. Yeah, dude. Like, uh, so cake, the cat's rad. She's, he's my new familiar, you know? (laughs) Like I fucking love, I love him. Uh, he's real cuddly. I'm, I'm happy for you. Thanks dude. Even though I hate cats, I'm happy for you. You know what? I hate cats too, but I love kittens. Well, there you go. Like kittens are fucking rad. Hell yeah. Um, speaking of kittens, we have a guest tonight. <laughs> <laughs> um, we have a guest tonight who uh, we've talked about this subject before, and I'm really interested to get into it again. Um, and, you know, I think that uh, 
I think we've been doing this long enough that people kind of know that we're not assholes. I hope so. So I just want to ask, I want to ask some, I would just want to ask some big questions. Yeah. You know, like, um, I don't know. We'll get into it. Yeah, we'll get into it. We'll get into it. Uh, so this Tuesday morning, Tome Tuesday, mm-hmm. I just want to introduce everybody to uh, a new friend of the Tome. Yeah. Uh, Andrew Rich. How you doing, Andrew? Not bad, not bad. Uh, sitting here a couple hours uh, east of Asheville, North Carolina, on a uh, nice, nice muggy Saturday. <laughs> yeah, dude, it's muggy here too, man. The fucking Columbus gets fucked up. Yeah, I honestly, I I loved summer when I was a kid. Head down to the beach, head up to the mountains, you know, family vacations. But the older I get, the more I get tired of it. It's just yeah summer's summer's not holding the same appeal it used to yeah yeah dude i don't like being hot either man i just sweat yeah i sweat like a motherfucker i used to be a big winter guy and then when i started having to drive to work or bike to work all the time i was like fuck winter but now that i work from home i'm like man winter's tight again yeah dude i love winter i get to just look out the window at snow hopefully and then go into my little office and put a blanket on and all that i fucking i love it all about snow man driving and everything dude i used to have to bike to work that shit is not yeah dude i did too (laughs) we did it together a few times (laughs) man um so you know enough about us andrew um I think that the best way that I could, uh, you know, describe our interactions were, um, the, you know, I, I, you found me on Reddit. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, I saw you had posted in a, uh, subreddit, um, uh, R X Mormon. And, uh, basically it is, it's a great, it's a great resource for, um, people who have either left or are questioning or are, you know, one of the big things that uh, kind of talked about is PIMO, uh, physically and mentally out. Um, you know, there, there are a lot of people like that. And it, uh, you had posted about uh, an episode that you had recorded and um, caught my interest, gave it a listen, and ended up going back and listening to more episodes. Yeah. And I got to say... I like your project. It's, um, <laughs> Thanks, man. I li- well, I mean, it's, it's like you've said a few times on on multiple episodes, you know, not being an asshole about anything and, you know, trying to take what's good where you can find it. Like, I, I think especially given the situation we're in right now, taking the good where you can find it is getting more and more important. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I agree, man. Um, so, you know, I think that that really piqued my interest too about you is that you hit me up and you were like, uh, you know, we're an ex, I'm an ex Mormon. And that led to me being like even a radical leftist, you know? And I was like, Oh, that's rad. Because like, that's something that me and Walter, um, you know, we know pretty well, you know, that's kind of what happened to us. It's like, we're ex Christians that are radical leftist funny how that goes, isn't it? You know, you learn about all this uh, goodwill and welfare toward your fellow people and uh, you grow up and you realize that you're not really seeing it where you're sitting. So you find a new place to sit. Yeah, dude, for sure, man. Um, so, you know, real quick, um, I just want to know where, like, tell us about your childhood. Tell us about growing up Mormon. Were you a fundamentalist? Were you, you know, more reformed? So, yeah. Uh, so there, there's basically uh, what I kind of see as three major veins of Mormonism. You've got your fundamentalists. That's your, you know, Warren Jeff. If you watch Big Love, those kind of folks out in the uh, Wasatch Front in Intermountain West, living out in the middle of nowhere in a compound, you know, yeah. one guy and God knows how many wives. Then you've got sort of two factions. Um, you have what's currently known as the Mormon Church or the LDS Church, and then you have the reorganized LDS Church, uh, which I think they rebranded as Community of Christ. Um, 
don't really know that much about them, except they do. They do generally seem to be a bit more welcoming of the uh, LGBTQ communities. Which you know that if, if you can find a church that's welcoming of them, you might be onto something. Uh, uh, again, that's that's a uh, plus in y'all's column. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I I grew up in just you know the sort of vanilla LDS church. Um, and, you know, did all of the stuff that, you know, some previous guests, a couple of previous guests have talked about, you know, bap- baptism at eight, because eight is definitely old enough to make, you know, decisions that are going to impact the rest of your life. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, dude, I love that um, age. <laughs> I love that that's the age they pick. Like eight years old, you're good. Get a job. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, and I mean, it's like, so, and this, this is actually something that on that subreddit comes up. It's like, yeah, eight years old, that's old enough to, you know, commit to this lifelong ideal. Oh, but you want to leave? Sorry, you can't do that till you're 18. Yeah. Kind of says a lot about what's going on. Um, but yeah, uh, I was, my childhood, you know, I, I hit the milestones. I was, you know, basically there, but, you know, kids, kids believe what they're told. Um, you know, and I think any decent parent, regardless of, you know, what religion they're practicing or not practicing, regardless of what philosophies or beliefs they have, they're they're honestly doing their damnedest to make sure that kid comes up right. And, you know, kids want to please their parents. So, you do what you're being told is right. You know, you get baptized. Yeah, you know, I turned 12 and uh, had the priesthood conferred upon me. So, you know, I actually had authority at some level or another in the church at the ripe old age of 12. Whoa, can you explain um, some of that to us? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so basically, um, the priesthood is divided into two levels. You have uh, what? referred to as sort of a lesser priesthood. Uh, It's called the Aaronic priesthood after Aaron in the Old Testament. And then you've got the Melchizedek priesthood, which is sort of the uh, greater of the two. Um, Now, if you've got, if you got a young man and he's been baptized and everything, every, every ordinance, everything that's done, um, before, before you actually go through with it, you've got to sit down with a bishop who, um, basically sort of like a priest or a pastor. He, he oversees, uh, what we call a ward, uh, it's essentially a parish or a congregation. So you talk to your bishop and you have a worthiness interview to make sure that, you know, you're, you're living the, the, your proper values, all of that, make sure that, you know, you're you're cleared to receive uh, whatever ordinance or authority you're getting at this particular milestone. So at 12, uh, you be, you, you, so long as you're worthy, which I mean, honestly, if you answer the questions, yes, yeah, good enough. And nobody really questions it. Yeah. At that point Um, at 12, you're just regurgitating what you've heard. Oh Yeah. Yeah, at 12, I think I was still, uh, I think at 12, I was still basically a Republican too. So, you know, it's, it's, <laughs> it's you know, it's, it's save what you've been told because that's what's expected. It's absolutely a regurgitation. Um, but, you know, you're, you're given responsibilities like, uh, you know, every Sunday. Uh, so I, I think uh, one or both of y'all grew up Catholic, yeah? Uh, we grew up Christian, not Catholic. Um, it was like okay, non-denominational, okay, no but I do know some about Catholicism. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Gotcha. So yeah, basically on Sundays for for sacrament, instead of you know people going to the front of the chapel to receive Eucharist, you know the uh, the bread and the water, not wine. It it is water in the LDS Church. Uh, that's you know blessed by, you know, we'll, we'll get to the priest in a couple of steps, but it's blessed by the priest and, uh, the deacons actually take the bread and the water on trays and pass it out to the congregation. And that's kind of their, their big responsibility. And, you know, it, it feels good to feel important and, you know, being kind of at the center of this important weekly ritual, you know, you feel good. You want, you want to do it. Right. So, you know, that's cool. Yeah. I mean, it's, 
And that, that's also one of the things that kind of, you know, in later years sort of got under my skin, this whole, you know, in-group, you know, us versus them, in-group versus others. And we'll get to that. Um, <laughs> but, yeah, if, if you fast forward a couple of years, uh, you, 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 you're you done being a deacon, if, you know, as long as you're, again, found worthy, which at 14 you know, I was mostly just trying to, you know, fly under the radar and not make any ripples. So, of course, you know, you just answer yes to all the questions. And you are ordained as a teacher. And their big thing is, um, you know, they get the bread and the water ready before sacrament services. And they, you know, break it all down after everything is done. Mm-hmm. Not much else. That's really about it. And then when you hit 16, as long as you answer yes to the checklist again, you become a priest. And that's the, uh, that's the highest level of the Aaronic priesthood. Wow. And basically what they do. Yeah. Yeah. So that's, and I mean, there's, there's not really any kind of, um, you know, there's not outside of worthiness, uh, interview. There's not really any sort of uh, qualifying exam, anything like that. It's just, you know, you're, you're 16 years old, you've been baptized, you already did these other two, and you answered yes to all of these questions. Okay, congratulations, you're a priest. And at that point, you actually sit at the front of the chapel with the bishop and his counselors, waiting until the actual sacrament uh, is set to begin. And you actually break the bread and then pray over the bread and water so the deacons can pass it out. That's the ironic priesthood. Uh, as a priest, you're also given the authority to baptize. So, you know, if, if you're doing everything the way you're supposed to and, you know, being a good member missionary too, uh, you know, if one of your friends at school decides they want to get baptized, you can be the one to do it oh, at damn. 16. They put a lot of pressure on yeah. some kids, dude. They do. They do. Um, and actually, this is this is actually kind of where my doubt, my journey of doubt began. Um, so outside of having these church responsibilities, you're also, well, I think they've, they've changed it. They've broken ties. The, the LDS church has broken ties with the Boy Scouts of America. But um, prior to this year, I think it was as recent as this year, maybe last year. Uh, but prior to that, uh, you were also expected to be active in your ward's uh, Boy Scout troop, you know, and they really, really pushed completing everything, getting your Eagle rank, which, you know, I did. But, you know, you're also given all these responsibilities um, sort of outside of that. And, I mean, I, I actually had a friend who, you know, he also grew, he grew up in the same ward I did and, you know, start kind of go his own way. And I was given the duty and expectation to bring him back to being a good and active member of the church. And I was about 14 when they laid that on. Damn. Yeah. And, you know, you, you can't make decisions for other people. So, I mean, try as you might, you know, you can't get this guy to come back. And, of course, you know, by the time he just tells you, no, leave me alone, I'm not talking to you anymore, you know, you start having this weird breakdown of, well, I'm doing something wrong. You know, am I not living the way that I, you know, am I not righteous enough? Mm. to have this power to bring people back to it. So you start that, that's when my foundation started cracking a bit. Um, because I mean, that's, that's a lot of pressure to put on a kid who can't even drive yet. Yeah. When, when, uh, immortal life, you know, your, your salvation is on the line. That's a fucking lot to put on a kid. It, it, it absolutely is. Um, but, you know, there, there are definitely uh, some organizational benefits to it because, you know, you send them out. And this, this actually I'm going to talk about more with all the mission work stuff. But, you know, you send somebody out to do God's work in a cold and uncaring world and they come back, you know, broken and shaken. 
and their church families there to lift them up and make them feel better. It, it, you start getting this idea that, you know, this is the only place that you belong. Mm. So it's, uh, it's, it's a tough place. It's a tough place to put kids. Um, and what's real fun is, you know, on top of all of that, um, you know, the church, they, they do their own kind of uh, summer activities too. Like uh, you have local things called youth conference where all the kids in a, in a larger geographic area get together for, you know, a few days of uh, what should be fun. You know, they, they do dances and such and uh but mostly a lot of indoctrination you know class after class about you know how hard it is to be in the world today but how important it is to live by these teachings and uh then you've got even larger geographic areas uh, something called efy especially for youth and it's basically you know summer camp for mormon kids yeah Mm. And, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's interesting because it, it really ra- runs similarly to a summer camp schedule wise. Like you've got activities blocked off hour after hour, after hour, after hour. Uh, but most of them are classes. Like, you know, this is, this is what we're being taught by the current prophets today. This is what we can learn from the ancient prophets. Uh, here are the dangers that the world is presenting, sex and drugs and all the usual boogeymen. Um, Wait, so are there new, there's new prophets? Uh, according to, according to LDS doctrine, um, the, the church when it was restored to the earth by Joseph Smith in the uh, 1820s, God set him apart as a prophet in the latter days. That's where we get the whole latter day saint thing. Um, So he was, he was called by God to be a prophet. And since then the leader of the church, it's been a succession of prophets and uh, it's decided like, I mean, so you look at, you look at something like the Vatican, the Pope dies, all of the Cardinals vote, you get a new Pope. Um, with, with the LDS church, it's mm, a lot more closed door. It's just sort of, Hey, we've received a revelation. Here's the new prophet. And it's going to be one of the, one of the guys that, you know, been part of that sort of inner circle already. Um, the president of the church is the prophet, the main leader, uh, he's got two counselors and then a quorum of 12 apostles, which it, you know, it's supposed to sound familiar, 12 yeah. apostles, just like uh, Jesus had. Um, so you've got, you know, basically a, uh, a pool of 14 people to choose from that could be, you know, next in line. And behind these closed doors, God reveals who the next prophet should be. And there you go. It's, oh it's shit! Done. So God reveals it. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Uh, the LDS Church believes in a living God and living revelation to the prophets. Um, which is a little it's it's a little interesting. I, I'd actually it's it's going to be dry, but I would recommend uh, actually looking through because it's it's all public. Uh, I mean nothing none of the addresses I'm about to kind of tell you about are private or anything, but, uh, twice a year, the church holds a general conference, uh, once in April, once in October every year. And it's supposed to be the living prophets addressing the church and the membership and, you know, giving you revelation or new, um, commandments, uh, Oddly enough, there really haven't been a whole lot of new, new revelations. Um, yeah. Except I, I for think, things to make them, most... except for things to maybe make them look better. Right. Like, oh, well, there's that. we, it's there's like, definitely that. Yeah. yeah I mean, it's well. like, we can't, we're not allowed to like, all right, maybe this is going to be where we start getting into big questions that I feel like we haven't okay. been able to answer yet. Maybe. I don't know. But, I seem 
I I've heard that when in the Mormon church, when a person of color dies, they are made white and that lets them go to heaven. Okay, so that, yeah, the organ in the deep question, that is, I'm going to say, yeah, this, this qualifies as something that is uh, the sort of revelation we get recently. Yeah. Uh, one of the things that's actually come up uh, pretty often is, or especially in the last couple of years, is the church disavowing previous teachings and saying that the prophet or apostle that stated these things were men acting as men and the product of their time. Oh. Um, yeah. Which kind of makes you wonder about the whole, you know, divine revelation thing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. that's like, yeah, I, I mean, you know, Joseph Smith wrote that shit who created the religion, you know? Yeah. Like, well, I mean, so you've got that, well, and and that's that's something else that's actually, you know, a lot of people. It's either plug your ears and just sort of la la la, I'm not hearing it, or you have to tackle it. But uh, the the original draft of the Book of Mormon literally said that the righteous inhabitants of this continent were white and delightsome, and that the wicked inhabitants had been cursed with a darkness of skin. Oh my God. Wow. And yeah, and it's, it's one of those things that, you know, you've got some people who choose to ignore it. You've got some people who look at it and say, oh, geez, man, this is, this is fucking bad. I, I gotta, I, I gotta figure some things out. Yeah. And then you've got some people who try to get into apologetics and say things like, oh, it was a change in their countenance, not their skin. Uh, even though the word literally said it was their skin and it so was written it, in English. Like there's, it, yeah, absolutely. there's no other, there's, there's no other, like with the Bible, a lot of times we hear, Oh, that, you know, this, this could mean 12 different things in Hebrew, but in the book of Mormon, it's like, oh, yeah. he wrote skin, homie, like he yeah. meant skin. Yeah. Yeah, and and one of one of the hallmarks of the translation of the Book of Mormon and the belief in it is that it was written, it was translated literally and perfectly. Yeah, yeah. And it so is. you end up with this issue of, and this this actually leads into something you might already be familiar with, but the prohibition of um, black members of the Mormon Church not being allowed to hold the priesthood or uh, participate in temple ordinances uh, until the 70s. Yeah. Yeah. I had heard some about that. That's fucking wild. Yeah. So they're, they're willing to give, they're willing to give a 16 year old, the title of priest, but a man who may be a different color. Absolutely not. Up until, until the seventies, yeah, Fuck. yeah. It took at least it took over a hundred years for that to be okay. Yeah, that and that stuff's so shocking because, like, I mean, I, I I understand growing up in it. It's like you don't know anything else, but it's just yeah. so wild as an adult to um, imagine being in a place where you're told, oh, you know. Uh, because you know, I mean, once you're an adult, you know people of color, and you're like, they're just like me, right? They're normal people. And then you have this book, and it's like, well, obviously that's a product of the time, right? Because they were thought of less than. So is that, how is that God's word? How is it God's word if it's or obviously prophet. tied to yeah. historical and inequality? Well, and, that, and that's the thing is there's been a lot of tracks covering. Uh, I think the uh, passage now says fair and delightsome uh, using the other definition of fair, you know, being equitable or just instead of, you know, fair skin. So it's like, okay, yeah, 
there was a little bit of a mix up in the transmission. It, it meant fair, not white. Uh, um, and, but something, something else that's kind of causing a lot of friction right now. And, you know, concerning things like you know, the, the black members, and I mean, I'm, I'm saying black because not all of the black church members were of direct African descent. Um, yeah. uh, you, you had, yeah, from all over, but a big part of what sort of, uh, brewing around that now is the fact that there are resources on the church's official website saying, Hey, this was wrong. It was a product of the time. And you know, that's, that's all we're going to say about it. So they, they're admitting that there was a fault there while also saying, you know, if you want to research, that's all well and good, but make sure you use proper church approved research material mm. which historically have glossed over a whole lot of problems um i mean you've got issues of you know I, everybody's familiar with you know the, the mormon stereotype of polygamy and that honestly for a good reason the early mormons were absolutely practicing it uh some with underage some with children for, for you know to put it in a single word you're talking about 14 year old kids getting married to 30 40 50 year old men yeah. jesus yeah. um and that's not something that you get from the official sources and it's it, and that's part of what's so frustrating about it is the com constant sort of what seems like a sense of obfuscation. Uh, I mean, something, if, if you've cruised that subreddit at all, something that you may have come across because it gets posted pretty regularly, there was a, uh, there was a, an apostle, uh, J. Reuben Clark, uh, way back. And what he said, he, he actually is quoted saying, if we have the truth, it cannot be harmed by investigation. If we have not the truth, it ought to be harmed. That came from the mouth of somebody regarded as a prophet, seer, and, re and revelator. Yeah. And now we're being told, well, yeah, investigate it, but only use the, the resources and the materials that we approve. Right. Yeah. Investigate it, but don't actually. Yeah. It's, it's like investigating the Bible with the Bible. You know, it's like, yeah, it's like, that doesn't, you know, that doesn't really work. Hey, I think this King James version got something wrong. Well, have you tried the Louis Sagan translation? Yeah. Uh, I'm yeah. going to try King James. With you then. It's, it's, it's just running around in circles and yeah. yeah. So, I mean, there, so there, there are some definite issues there. Um, you know, and then if you really start diving into the history, of course, you get into the issues of polygamy, um, underage brides, men being sent on missions and their wives being married to the prophet while they were gone. A lot of, a lot of, uh, unsavory and odious things happening that gets covered up and glossed over. Yeah. And I think that that's the thing too, is like, Something I respect is that they are willing to change things, right? Like, I respect yeah. that. Um, like, they're like, hey, w we don't want to be racist anymore. Um, but the way that they do it is wrong. <laughs> you know, they just, like, change little bits of the book, don't admit fault, and then fucking just be like, this is truth now because the prophet said it. Like, and then cover it, right and back then cover up. it yeah. up. And I think that that's a problem. I, cause really like me and Walter were like, Hey, we're going to make this religion. And part of the reason was because the Bible claims to be living and active. And I was like, I don't think that's true. You know, I think that the yeah. Bible was written this long ago and it's not living anymore. It's dead. And it fucking has racist shit in it and all this other stuff. And I was like, so let's fucking cancel it and make something new that we are able to change, you know, like no we are able to serve your master. Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah. yeah so that, that's actually one of my favorite verses that was added was, you know, slaves revolt, masters set them free. Yeah. That's, that I, 
That was a good episode. Yeah. Well, dude, I love doing that episode. <laughs> yeah, we appreciate that, man. Um, and you know, I think that, you know, that was our second episode and it was like, we need to let people know right where we stand right now in history, you know, of like, Oh yeah. absolutely. I, you know, those were when the, you know, the protests were going on that people were calling riots, you know, and shit like that. And it was like, we just need you to know that we're not about this right off the bat. Like, yeah. um, so if you say equality, mean quality. Yeah. Fuck. Yeah. Hell yeah. Um, so, you know, you're, I think that I want to get back to a little bit of you too. Um, so you're 16, you become a pre, uh, a priest. Um, and then when, like, so we know that there's missions where the men go out and they ride bicycles and suits. Um, and, uh, can you tell us some about that? And like, I mean, like, when's yeah, that? Does absolutely. that does that happen to you? Is that f- what you do? Like, you know, what happened from sixteen to there? You know, or to when you left? So yeah, so at at sixteen, you know, you you received the last level of the Aaronic priesthood, and at eighteen, uh, again, if you're found worthy, you can be ordained into the Melchizedek priesthood as an elder. Uh, if you've encountered um, Mormon missionaries in the wild, you see that their name tag say elder. Oh, yeah. It's, it's literally just the station they hold in the priesthood. Um, now, I'm, I'm going to come back to that. There's one more office uh, as well. Uh, I'm not sure what the actual qualifications are. It just seems like, you know, being older and around for a while but uh you can be you can be ordained as a high priest and that's sort of where the uh greater or melchizedek priesthood taps us we've got elders and high priests yeah that's when you're in the running for maybe prophet right eventually yeah so so there's actually a quite a bit of a ladder to climb so you have to be ordained as a high priest to be a member of the bishopric a bishop or his counselors yeah. Uh, if you do well enough with that, they might make you a stake president. So stake is a group of wards. Think of it like a diocese or something. Okay. Um, so basically just, you know, more authority over a greater area. And then beyond that, there's sort of regional leadership. It's um, elder, it's uh, apostles of forms of 70. And if you work through that, you then can possibly get into the, um, into the form of the 12 apostles, which that puts you in the running for, you know, becoming the prophet or president. Um, oh yeah. So yeah. High, high priest is where That's you where start I'm trying to get. Leadership. I'm trying to get to profit. Hey, hey, man. Mm. hey you're built, you're building this one. You, you can put yourself there or you can, uh, you can throw it to the people and make it democratic. <laughs> oh yeah. Um, I'm, I'm a fan of direct democracy, so I, yeah, that's the one I'd recommend. I feel um, that, dude. <laughs> yeah, me too. Yeah, wind it back a little bit. Um, yeah. at, at 18, you become an elder. You may become an elder. Um, some folks don't stick around that long. Some folks get there and decide, yeah, this isn't for me. Um, if the ward and everybody in it's been doing their jobs, you know, you end up with somebody like me who's already doubting anyway. And they decide to go ahead with it. So to be, or you become ordained as an elder and to actually finish that off, you go through uh, a ceremony in one of the temples uh, called the endowment ceremony. Um, You know, I'm not going to get too much into that because I still have respect for a lot of people in, you know, that that I'm very close to in the church. So I'm not going to get too deep into what actually happens. Yeah. Uh, suffice it to say, it's, it's a lot of stuff cribbed from the Masons uh, to, to make it really short. Um, but basically, it's it's uh, sort of the explanation. Uh, it, it, it's a re it's a re explaining of what happened in the Book of Genesis. You know, the first couple of chapters, creation, and you make covenants to make sure that you're going to be a good, faithful Mormon for the rest of your life. Um, but like all of the actual ceremony, uh, if, if you can get someone to talk to you about it, all well and good. If you can get somebody to talk to you about Masons, 
it's basically the same thing. Yeah. <laughs> um, oh, so you're saying you're saying that there's some mysticism in it and stuff like that. Oh, absolutely, absolutely, and. And it's, you know, some people think it's a coincidence. Some people kind of see it more for what it is. But, you know, after uh, Joseph Smith reached a certain level in his local Masonic Lodge, he gets a revelation for these um, temple ceremonies, uh, yeah. which are basically Masonic rites. <laughs> um, so, yeah, you go through this whole thing. They, you know, you, ha- you have some ceremonies and you're ordained an elder and you can opt to serve a mission. Uh, when I left the age to do so was 19. You, you, you can decide to do it between the ages of 19 and 27. I think they've lowered the age for guys. Uh, they've lowered the age. And when when we talk in the Mormon church about, you know, guys and women or men and ladies, it, it comes down to biological sex. Um, that's, that is a hard and fast rule. It is, you know, you are what you were assigned at birth. Right. Um, so, but yeah, for guys, it was 19. It's now 18, uh, for, for women, it was 21. I believe it's down to 20 or 19 now. Um, and because, you know, 19 years old is, is a great time for you to decide to, leave home and start peddling religion to people in a different part of the world. So Literally peddling. All these to do that. Yeah. It's, it, it's kind of, it's kind of a mind fuck, man. It's, um, so I, I told you earlier about the, uh, the EFY camps where, you know, you go and you have these classes all day and then you have maybe some fun activities at night. Um, when you decide to go on a mission, you go you go to Provo, Utah, to a place called the Missionary Training Center, and you wake up every day at six. You spend all day in classes or at the temple, which is across the street, and you go to bed at ten. Rinse yeah. and repeat. Um, if and you did this. I did this. I did oh, this. Man. Um, if you're going on an English speaking mission, uh, when I was at the MTC, an English speaking mission, I think it was, it was either four or six weeks of training. So, you know, you're basically learning how you're basically, honestly, you're learning salesmanship, uh, for, you know, for clarity, it's it's salesmanship. Mm. If you're like me and you go on a foreign speaking mission, uh, it jumps, yeah, Canada, Montreal. Uh, learned uh, learned Canadian French, <laughs> um, but uh, but yeah, you were there anywhere from. I think I was there for twelve weeks. Uh, some of the other languages, like uh, Mandarin or Russian, uh, you're there longer. It you're there for a good long while, and uh, you know, as far as language learning, it was actually pretty solid. Like you get to a certain point and you're expected if you speak to somebody who's part of your group, you're expected to speak in your foreign language. Um, I honestly think that was the best thing I got out of it. Yeah, dude. Um, (laughs) but, uh, after your time's up, they, uh, they fly out to your mission and, you know, I, I ended up in, uh, in Quebec, Canada, uh, started in a little suburb called Chattagay. It's uh, south of Montreal and kind of ranged all over for a while. Um, and, you know, being perfectly honest, like going out there with any kind of doubts at all is kind of a dangerous gambit. Um, because, like, one of, the, one of the things that I started realizing was all of the sort of warm fuzzies that made me think maybe there's something to this. Like they, they were gone forever. Like that, that was not there. Uh, there was no comfort from God. There was, you know, I had all these questions that I was being asked and couldn't answer. And that, you know, started other questions. And, um, I actually, uh, this is something that didn't happen a lot before, but it's happening a lot more or was happening a lot more recently. But like, uh, missionaries would just, they, they would break and, end up going home 
Like they, it's for, for men, it's supposed to be two full years. Um, yeah. I wasn't out quite a year before my brain just broke. Oh um, God. yeah, I'm sure. I mean, like, so, I like just to pause you real quick, um, and work yeah. our way back. Like you were, you were saying that like kind of from the age of six on, like you weren't completely about it. Um, what, what what do you think was keeping you there? Social ties. Like if, if I'm being like a hundred percent honest with myself, I really think it was social ties. Like, I mean, that's where your family is. Uh, I mean, you grow up in it. That's where your friends really are. Um, and I mean, the church and I, like, we're still sort of on speaking terms. Like, I mean, I'm, I'm not kicking anybody out of my house unless they start breaking a house rule. But, uh, you know, and house rules are basic stuff like, you know, LGBT rights or human rights. Black Lives Matter, injury to one is an injury to all. Yeah, and dude. You know, Trista, Fuck yeah, baby. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you start walking on that, you're done. You're you're out. Um but I mean if somebody if somebody can come in and respect those rules, I'm not gonna throw them out of my house. Yeah. Like that that's kind of a dick move. Like I might not be happy with what they're bringing in, but they're not actively you know, if if they're not actively tearing down my core beliefs, I'm not, I'm not going to do the same to them. Which again, you know, kind of feel like that fits with what I've heard from you guys. So yeah, you know, I mean, I split, think that if you're not doing harm, I think at the the at the least of it, it in my mind, it's like they might want to tear down what I'm doing the least I can do is respect, you know, that, you know what I mean? Like it's kind of that kill kindness, you know, kill, kill with kindness. It's like, I'm going to respect what you got to say, homie. Yeah. Um, even if you don't like what I have to say, um, we got to have civil discourse, you know? Yep. Um, hundred percent. So Um, you, you went on your mission and, uh, I, you know, it sounds from what you were saying that that shit was rough. Um, Oh yeah. Yeah. And, um, and you hightailed it. You were like, I'm out. Yeah. I, you know, threw up deuces and and the short, the shortest version possible is one night. I just sort of left, walked out, uh, spent a while strung out on this, that, and the other, uh, ended up getting back in contact with family, got back home and tried to put the pieces back together. Um, and I mean, being perfectly frank, I'm still trying to put the pieces back together from, um, so you left and you didn't even go back home for a while. No. Yeah. 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 I was, um, I, I was, I was missing an action for a while. Um, but you know, that, that's a long story for another time. Yeah. Um, yeah. but yeah. you know, family, family trying to do the best they can for people they care about, you know, they, they did everything they could to encourage me to come home when I was in contact with them. Um, and, you know, to their credit, they gave me all the space I needed when I got back. So, mm-hmm. like, you know, I I reported to Dorval Airport uh, looking like a scuzzy gutter punk and getting confused looks from the customs guys about my ministerial visa. <laughs> and um, from that point, you know, got on the plane, ended up in, uh, at Raleigh-Durham International and probably spent a good two weeks not talking to anybody just yeah it it was it was that kind of uh that kind of homecoming um and that's that's when things really started to you know get a little weird for me like you know is is this right is this not right um you know i i had been mostly a good kid mostly uh, definitely, uh, if, if you know the stereotypes about theater kids, I was a, one of the tech theater kids Yeah. and high school. Oh yeah. Love tech theater in high school. But, um, 
it's kind of funny that high school rap parties for uh, for uh, play productions. There, there, there are jokes and stereotypes in every high school about those kids for a reason. A, they get wild. <laughs> yeah. um, uh, I was so, actually a know, part of. I, I was a part of stage crew, man. I know exactly what you're talking about. I built shit. Hell yeah! So, oh yeah, yes. I was uh, it's spotlight operating and uh, pyrotechnics. We actually, my senior show, we actually got to do pyro. Oh, that's so. sick. <laughs> Fuck yeah. Rad. yeah, and you better believe it, there was a uh, pie, there was a uh, pyro display at the uh, rap party for that one. <laughs> so, oh yeah, <laughs> that's rad, man. But but yeah, you know, I, I get back and um, you know I've I've got a lot of things to deal with, and this is actually where I kind of want to lay out my uh, you know my first verse might be echoing some others but you know I don't mind repeating the Bible does it plenty so first verse in my book is get therapy you need it oh, um, Madeline's rad that was a good introduction like their yeah, induction yeah. introduction induction of that of, of a verse I love that go to therapy get therapy you need it um I can tell you right now, uh, so we, we've talked a little bit about, you know, obfuscation and covering things up and, you know, I've, I've got some issues with that, but I've also got some issues with how, uh, how my experience, uh, with the church dealing with, uh, mental or behavioral health was. So I get back and I mean, there, there's a whole whole arm of the church. It's uh, LDS social services. And I'm like, you know what? They'll, they'll hook me up with, with a psychologist that I can talk to. It'll be affordable because they're going to be watching out for me. And, you know, after three sessions of being told that, you know, just pray and study your scriptures more and that'll take care of it you start to realize that they're not really looking out for you and then that, uh, and that, um, actually Madeline recently, I saw her, she shared a post on Instagram that was like, uh, church counselors aren't therapists. Like they're just, it's not, it's not therapy. Yeah. They're not trying to do it. Go somewhere else. I don't care if your church I has therapists. I sign that fast enough. Oh yeah, that fucking, is, she, she's a hundred percent right on yeah, that. Just fucking go somewhere else. Get out of your church to clear your mind. Uh, don't go to yeah, absolutely. church counselors. So, so, I mean, I like, I gave up on therapy because of that experience. I like, said, like, okay, no, this, this isn't working. And, you know, this, and a lot of people have experience with this. Uh, but, you know, I think we can all agree that, you know, drugs and liquor don't replace therapy. Um, I yeah. really wish they did for a while. Uh, <laughs> Gotten to, gotten to some things that I really shouldn't have. Um, and ended up actually trying to come back to church, like really making a hard effort. Um, yeah. You know, started going back with my parents and, you know, sitting in the adult Sunday school classes and hearing all of the same answers you hear about how, you know, important it is to pay your tithing and pray and to make these offerings and to sacrifice this time and that time to really make things, make the church work. Like I, I couldn't stomach it. So luckily, like my mom was in charge of the nursery, which is where kids that are less than four uh, go during church so their parents can go to Sunday school. So I brought up the age. Age is important because at four or five, you go into what's called primary, basically Sunday school for kids. And four or five is when you start learning the doctrine. You start learning about, you know, Jesus said this, Joseph Smith said that, and we follow what they said. So like, fucking four years old um and so yeah i was helping in primary and uh another very long story made very short uh or i was helping in uh in nursery but another long story made real short is um ended up being introduced 
to um, to someone's sister. Uh, you know, she's a year older than me, had some similar opinions on things. And, you know, fast forward a couple of years, we're dating and we actually got married in a temple local to us. So like I, I did all, I hit all the marine milestones, you know, I, mm-hmm. I was baptized at eight, went through all my priesthood stuff, did my mission, married in the temple. And, and this, this is where that, that first verse that I threw out, it's already been thrown out once, you know, get therapy. Um, this is where it really came in because, you know, I stress at work, stress trying to figure out where I stood with church, stress trying to, you know, work out what's, you know, what's right, what's where, like, I know what's right and wrong. So why, why can't this church I go to figure it out? Mm. Like, you know, the LGBTQ community, they are people and deserve to be treated like people. It's not difficult. Um, I was actually part of a a group for a while called Mormons Building Bridges. Uh, And basically, it is a group of fairly dissatisfied Mormons who are trying to reach out and build relationships with the LGBTQ community, which I think is, you know, at the time, I thought that was one of the best things I'd ever heard. Right. Because... The church, you know, be, being as frank as we can be, they're not doing any favors to our brothers and sisters in that community. Yeah. Um, so we actually, uh, so Durham Pride, like it's, it's a big event. Um, Duke campus is a huge part of it, Duke University campus. Mormons Building Bridges, the local group set up a hugging booth. So, you know, we went to Pride, we had a bunch of stickers, you know, I was hugged by a Mormon and we were there to, you know, put our hands out and, in, in a show of solidarity and love and community. And it was the best experience, hands down, I have ever had with a bunch of folks from church. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That's rad. That sounds like a cool thing. Yeah. yeah. Oh, it was great. It was great. And, you know, that was on a Saturday. And then Sunday, where's, you know, so to give you just, a, you know, kind of a little bit of what goes on on a, on a regular Sunday before COVID happened, before this, that, and the other, you know, you had an hour where you had sacrament meeting, you know, you had your sacraments, um, ritual being done. You, you had people speaking on different topics that went for an hour. Then you had an hour of Sunday school. Then you, then the men and women separated and you had an hour of instruction in those separate classes. And which, you know, that's, that brings up its own issues. Um, but in, in the third hour in our priesthood meeting, you know, they, they want us to talk about missionary experiences we've had. And I'm like, hey, this this is a good this is a great time. Tell people what's up, you know. Say, hey, there's you know, we've got neighbors, we've got friends, we've got brothers and sisters who don't feel loved by this church. And there's a group out there trying to do something about it. And I had this great experience with them. And the only response that I got was from the guy leading the meeting, and he's like, so, like was that just sort of some sort of special interest contacting or were you trying to get missionary leads? Like, and oh my God. I, I mean, I could, I had no reaction to that. Right. Exactly. Yeah. No reaction. Like all I could think is, you know, fucking this guy is trying to get sales leads out of me having a wholesome experience with people who are already hurting enough. We don't need to send you know, black name tag missionaries to them to say, Hey, come to church. Like that was the opposite of what I was trying to do. Jesus. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's it's an act of love and you want to turn it into a numbers game. Right. I think that's a thing that's always, uh, I mean, our church had some of that too. Uh, just like the hyper evangelism. I think it really just leaves, human beings uh in the background like they're the real human beings that are supposed to be so precious they get uh overlooked 
Yeah. Absolutely right. But you know, these no, you 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 hit that right on the head. It's like these these are human beings. These are not leads, these are not numbers, these these are people who have been very literally oppressed for centuries. And I'm just trying to show some love to them. We don't need yeah. to do anything else with it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, you, you have things like that happen. And so, I mean, it's so a stress from church, especially. And I just, you know, I had a little, I had a breakdown and, you know, ended up, actually being kind of resourceful and, you know, get in touch with, uh, my employer's, um, employee assistance program, got into therapy and holy hell, it makes a difference. So, you know, get outside the church. I was, get, get outside of whatever population you happen to be in. You know, what, if you are part of a majority population, get away from that population to fix what's going on. That's, that's going to be my big takeaway there. Um, because I mean, I, I was lucky enough that the, uh, that the long-term psychologist I landed on, um, their partner was also somebody who had made an exit from the Mormon church. So they, that's rad. I mean, that, yeah, it was fucking lucky for me. Like they were able to, uh, you know, understand without ha- having me rehash a lot of things, which was, I mean, it was just, yeah. it was amazing. Um, and it's, it's made a huge difference. Like, I mean, my wife, who is one of the most loving and patient people I've ever met. Um, I mean, she's, she's, you know, a little bit of a, uh, what people in the church right now kind of see as a bit of a radical and a loose cannon because, you know, she's actually been asked to volunteer to help teach the, uh, the young women. So, I mean, you're talking, uh, 12 to 18 year olds and her big focus is telling them you need to do what makes you happy. If you don't want to get married, if you want to go to college and pursue a career instead of getting married, that is, that is a valid endeavor and you're allowed to do it, which is, you know, the fact that that's considered kind of radical is not great. Yeah. Yeah, yeah absolutely. So not. the so the woman that you married in the Mormon church, you are still married to. Absolutely. Yeah. And yeah, she um, is still in the Mormon church. She is. Oh, OK. She is. Yeah. How's, um, how's that work? So I've, I've actually been one of the lucky ones. Um, so I, I've mentioned warden bishops uh, in, in lower populated areas. You have what are called branches and they have a branch president. They basically left me alone. Um, they, they don't bother me. I think, I think Holly has actually, that, that's my wife. Uh, I'm okay. not going to say much more about that. Yeah, names. that's fine. Uh, but I, I think she actually kind of took point for me and went to them and said, Hey, I, I am 100% here. You, you know, I, I'm going to do what I need to do, but don't, don't bother my husband. Wow. And like in, in what is a fairly rare turn of events, like they've basically left me alone. Like, I mean, any contact is essentially on my terms. Wow. That's cool. Dude, that's uh, rad. Me and Walter are both supported yeah. by very good women. Yeah. You know, yeah. as well. And like uh um you know, it's it, it's good to have somebody in your corner. Um it's just Oh, absolutely. You know, yeah, and my wife stayed around for a while after I left too and I think that what was awesome is like part of it was like maybe our marriage even got better once I was gone, you know, it's like I, like I'm not happy, I'm out, you know. Yeah, well and and that and that kind of something that that I, that we've noticed as well is like between me actually paying attention to, you know, working in therapy and me stepping away from the church like I, my headspace has gotten better. 
I mean, my my level of happiness is at a completely different level, and it opens up a lot of bandwidth for me to do things for my my spouse, my part, my wife. You know, the the most yeah. important person in my life. And, you know, being able to actually do those things, it, I mean, like you said, your marriage actually gets better because you are there in the capacity that you should have been there from the start. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. Um, and this, this might be, so this might be, um, the worst question to ask after we're talking about marriage and love and uh, beautiful things, but somebody reached out on our Facebook group, the Tomies. Um, you know, I reached out and I was like, Hey, like, uh, we're doing a episode with an ex Mormon tonight. Uh, what are some questions? And one person really was about trying to understand Mormon underwear. Okay. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so, there, there are a lot of possible answers for that. My answer for the longest time, because if, if we go back to what I said about, you know, things happening in the temple, uh, part of, part of the promises that are made are that you're going to wear it and it will, you know, it's going to remind you of the covenants you've made and protect you. Okay. C- can you tell now, us what those undergarments are? Uh, I mean, honestly, uh, yeah, if, if you've ever seen a pair of, uh, if, if you've ever seen a baseball player's pair of sliding shorts, yep. uh, the, the bottom part looks a lot like that is basically a knee length boxer briefs. <laughs> um, oh shit. And, and yeah, knee length, knee length, bro. It's, uh, always, always pants or close to it. Um, and the top is, I mean, for, for men, it's basically an undershirt. Um, women have cap sleeves. That, that's really kind of all there is to the design. There, there are some, like, there's some symbology involved, but mostly what I read it as, and I ran this by, you know, when I was still on my mission, ran this by my mission president. He's like, you know, if that's how you read it, you know, that's true for you. But the way I read it is it was a lot like a uh, prayer shawl that uh, Orthodox, uh, members of Orthodox Jewish uh, sects will yeah. wear. But that, uh, I found out that my, my personal belief on that isn't really um, a majority belief. Yeah. Uh, there are a lot of anecdotal stories, a uh, whole lot of, Oh, this happened to somebody I know, or like urban legend kind of connection. Oh, right? dude, you know, could you give me one of those? Friend. So, so yeah. really, the fact yeah. is, real quick, that you're wearing this suit, right? Basically, like this, these pants and shit. And then, yeah, is there a hole cut out? Like, do you you are are you supposed to have sex in these? I never did. <laughs> <laughs> I think, yeah, I think you yeah, have to take no. them off, buddy. I don't okay. think you have sex. Yeah. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, it's the, the guy's underwear has a fly, but that, that's about it. But no, as, as far as, as far as, you know, sex and anything like that, you know, we, you know, as far as I know, standard practice is bare ass naked. Fully nude. So. Okay. Yeah. I guess I was wondering. Yeah. So it's just like, that's everyday attire. Yeah, pretty much. Uh, I mean, you you make you make a promise that you're going to wear it to remember your covenant, which is where I kind of keyed in on it being kind of like a prayer shawl. You know, it you wear it as a symbol of your connection to God. But I have actually there was a guy that I worked for um, who was cleaning his driveway and using some sort of. Uh, like highly caustic acid to clean stains off his driveway. And he swore up and down that when some of it spilled on his leg, it burned through his jeans and it burned through his underwear, but it didn't touch his skin. And there have been, there are urban legend type stories about how, you know, 
there have been fires and, you know, these people were blessed because they had third degree burns all over their face and their arms and their legs, but where their, where their underwear was, was protected and safe. And I'm like, you know, a piece of Jersey cotton isn't going to do that. So, <laughs> Dude, give me a whole suit. Yeah. That's like a superpower. You That's know, a- if, if, if it actually worked, it would be the best thing ever. Yeah. <laughs> but I can tell you right now, uh, <laughs> um, you know, it, and it, you know, maybe it's cause I didn't have enough faith in it, but you know, I, I have <laughs> dropped, uh, I have dropped Bard Parker knives, exacto knives. I've dropped hot solder slag on my leg. And when I was still wearing them, didn't do a thing for me. It, you know, if I dropped the Bard Parker knife, the blade went through. If I draw, if, I ended up with some solder swag. Oh, I felt it burn. It definitely did. Yeah. Um, so, you know, that, that just might be my own shortcomings as a, as a holy man. I don't so know. God, God just, <laughs> God just really likes seeing people wear, the, wear his underwear. Oh yeah, dude. That's the whole thing. Must be. I mean, wouldn't you? <laughs> I mean, we're starting a religion. Maybe we should do some like, maybe like super sexy underwear though. Oh yeah, dude. Like, like you're yeah. only allowed to wear super I, sexy underwear <laughs> all the time. <laughs> yeah, dude. G See, I was, was going to recommend like ball caps or t-shirt, you know, yeah. Just, you know basic stuff. Yeah. So, which, yeah. <laughs> which at some point you can buy that at our store. <laughs> I don't you know, know, dude. Tome of chaos branded <laughs> thong, a thong with like my face on it. That's or your hot. Face on it. That sounds cool to me. Yeah. I mean, dude, Dude, I'm just about- like me and you high fiving on like some booty shorts, <laughs> like like, well, and they're like unisex booty shorts. Oh, hell yeah, they <laughs> you know, like I fucking that's what we need, dude. Um, man, that's hey, any article of clothing is unisex if you're not a coward. Okay, yeah, oh, yeah, you're that's right. True. You're right. Um, so you know, we've talked a little bit about your story and where you got to, and. uh I mean, I think that yeah. it's rad. Like, I love hearing um, people's journeys. Um, and I think it's incredible that you're still, you and your wife are still chugging along through all that. Like, I mean, you're doing well, something I think right. What it's really to do is if you, if you love somebody at the most honest level possible, you love them for being them, not for carrying an identification card for this organization or that religion. You, you love Dude. them because of who they are. I mean, I felt that, I, and, you know, I think Walter and I can both attest that we felt that with our wives and we feel that about our wives. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, Dude, like leaving a religion's one thing, starting a religion's a whole nother thing. Try to talk to your wife about that. <laughs> you know, <laughs> Sarah. Sarah still sometimes is like, "All right, like, you know, what's this gonna become?" You know, like, and um, but you know, she sticks in there. She's one of my, you know, she fucking, she's rad, and we're gonna have her on soon too. It's, it'll be incredible. Um, but I want to talk to you about where you're at now. Yeah, where I'm at now. I, uh, I was in a previous life, a card carrying Mormon. I am now literally a card carrying leftist, uh, in my wallet right now. I've got my red card with the IWW. Fuck yeah. Um, so yeah, basically like the thing there, there are things that I like about, Christian doctrine in general, maybe not necessarily Christian teachings or Christian culture. Yeah. And technically the Mormon church, you know, they, they believe that, you know, the savior of humanity is Jesus Christ, the guy from the new Testament. So, you know, I, I'm still in the camp that technically, yeah, I still think they're Christian. And what I found, like where I kind of found myself was this whole sit with the sinners, make space for the criminals and just preach love to everybody. I wasn't finding that. And as things started going on, like um, I'm trying to think, I think we actually, 
I actually ended up joining the IWW. It was after uh, the Trump election. But, I mean, I was already on my way out from, you know, Democrats are going to fix things. But I don't necessarily, you know, want to say good or bad for one party or another. But I was basically an angry liberal yelling in my living room with my angry liberal friends about what we needed to do to fix things, but nobody was going to. And being as a kid, I was reading Marx and Engels. I was reading Goldman. I mean, this was in high school. I was yeah. reading that stuff. And there was there was some early cognitive dissonance because, uh, and this this is actually something that. This is something that I will actually mention from the temple. Like one of the covenants you make is to the law of consecration, where you consecrate yourself, your property, and your time to be used for the benefit of the church and the people in it. And it's like, you know, the church is basically, you know, at at its, it, it's most holy order, like where it aspires to go, is basically an anarcho-communist commune. Yeah, that's true. And, and yet you've got people like Mitt Romney running for office as a representative of the church. Like, so there is this really loud clanging dissonance in my brain, and I'm like, okay, cool, yeah, I'm all for, you know if my neighbor needs something and I've got, and I can help, I'm going to help that neighbor and they're going to do the same for me, which I mean, that's, that's as basic as you can get with Marx. I mean, from each according to his ability to each according to his need. I mean, that's the, the church's law of consecration or united order is literally Marxism. Yeah. Um, which that's always something fun to bring up because it's kind of a hotbed for modern libertarians. And I mean that like capital L libertarian party type. Mm -hmm. And when you bring up that, you know, the faith they believe in says they should probably be an anarcho communist instead of a libertarian. That kind of, that, that triggers an interesting conversation. Dude, it's real. It's um, one of my funnest thing. One of my favorite things is telling Christians that Jesus was an anarchist and a communist. Oh, he absolutely was. Yeah. I mean, look, look at the sermon on the Mount. Like people were hungry and according to the book, he had the means to feed them. So he did without thought of recompense. Like that, that is anarchist and as communist as you get. Like, I mean, it sounds like you, you are, you know, in left and uh, leftist uh, spheres and groups. And it's like, honestly, the anarchists I know, they're out there doing uh, soup kitchens and trying to feed the homeless. Yeah. Like they're, they're not in it for the looting. They're in it to help folks who don't have. No, we, I mean, really, like, all I'm about is burning down the shit that fucks us over and giving it to everybody else. Absolutely. You know, like I yeah. think we have um we have food not bombs here and they give all the time. Like, especially in my neighborhood where I live, like, um, they're always setting up like no questions asked, uh we give food. Like it's rad. Like people just come and grab yeah. it, you know? Whereas like which makes me like think about the government. Like whenever you get government assistance, you gotta like show your bank account and your taxes. You know, it, right? and we have this company yeah. out here that's just, we just have this organization that's just like, hey, we're not going to, we don't care. Yeah. Beautiful. If you need it, come get it. You yeah. know, even if you don't need it, you just want it. Come get it. Yeah. Yeah. I, we, um, our, our local branch uh, of, of the industrial workers, um, there's, there's a part of it. It's workers feeding workers and there for a while. Like I, there was, there was a monthly setup where, you know, we would set up a meal, like a, a buffet smorgasbord style meal that a bunch of people pitched in to buy, to cook and to bring. And anybody just like food, not bombs, anybody that wanted to stop by, you know, if you, if you need a bite, you got food. And it wasn't difficult and people were always shocked. It's like, you know, so, so what are you, what are you trying to get? It's like nothing. We just, we want to make sure people have food in their bellies. 
Right. Like it's, it's not difficult. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, but, I, I mean, mean, you know, I think that, you know, I think that's something that like i I latched onto was like, I don't understand why when I'm giving somebody food to eat, I also have to hand them a Bible, you know, or a you know, pamphlet that, or like, this, like, that's not, that's not what it's not about. Necessary. Yeah. If they want to know about it, they're going to ask about it. And if they don't ask about it, I don't need to tell them about it. Um, and that's, that's part of what I really like. I mean, I ended up sort of stumbling on the IWW just while I was searching for local leftist organizations because I wanted to try to hook up with, you know, whatever was going on on the ground out here. And I mean, I've marched in, you know, I've, I've, I've helped with workers feeding workers here and there. I've helped with uh, organizer trainings. I've marched in May Day demonstration or May 1st demonstration, you know, real Labor Day. Yeah. And not one has anybody asked for, you know, not, not once has anybody taken advantage of the people there, you know, to try to get money or materials or anything at all like that. It's always been just, you know, if we have something that somebody seems to need, it's there. It's not difficult. Like, I mean, when I was a kid, one of the first things I learned was to share with other kids. And I just wonder, like, you know, where did that lesson turn into, you know, I got mine, fuck you, yeah. this is mine, you can't have it. Like, it's it's such a disconnect, and it's it's heartbreaking how how much our country and sort of the uh, the climate we're in right now breeds that. Yeah. But on top of that, how much churches who should be teaching better than that seem to be sort of a breeding ground for it as well. Like, I mean, I I don't recall in any of my studies, you know, any prophets or holy men saying, you know, guard your property with your life. It's always give to the less fortunate, give to those who need sell all you have and give it to the poor. Like yeah. that's, that's what it always is. Yeah. And I wasn't finding, I wasn't finding that as a major tenet or tent post in any religion, but I found it with a bunch of weird leftists who treated me like I belonged there from the jump and never stopped. Like, I, I've had extended absences and come back. Nobody cares. They're just happy to see me and they want to make sure I'm doing all right. It's, you know, if I, I mean, I had a lapse where I couldn't pay my dues for a while. Like, I mean, the IWW, it is a union. You do pay dues. And I had a lot, you know, I had a period of unemployment and I couldn't pay my dues for a while. Ended up talking to, um, to one of the guys who had actually come down and trained me as a trainer. And he was like, you know, just, uh, re just, you know, reapply and start paying dues fresh. Don't worry about, don't worry about paying back dues. You'll keep your same number and we'll just start you over. Fuck yeah. Hell yeah. Like it, they, they do what I feel like churches should do. <laughs> they meet you where you are. And they help you in your attempts to make yourself and your world and your community a better place. Yeah. Yeah, dude, the uh, the International Workers of the World is a great organization. Um, if nobody has checked them out before, like they do a lot. They, they help people get the information to protest and to um, unionize and things like that. It's incredible. Fuck yeah. Yeah, and there's actually a, um, I don't know if it's an actual affiliated committee or if it's just something that um, a lot of branches help participate in, but there's also, uh, I, I think it's part of the IWW, but it's called IWOC, mm -hmm. the Incarcerated Workers Organizing Committee. Yeah, it is, it is a part of the union. Yeah. But basically, they actually go in and because, I mean, 13th Amendment, you know, slavery is illegal unless you're a prisoner. Yeah. 
so slavery is still legal if you're in prison. And IWAP goes in and helps prisoners organize. Like a couple of years ago, I don't know if you've heard about it, but in a couple of uh, states, there were prison strikes. And the prisoners had a work stoppage. Because, you know, I don't, I don't care what they did. They're... I, I can't say I don't care what they did. There are some things that I have a hard time getting past. Like, yeah. you know, yeah. Yeah. you do something to kids, I'm not going to be able to forgive you for that. But it doesn't mean that you should be a slave. Right. Yeah. Nobody should have to be a slave. Absolutely not. Um, I mean, slaves revolt. It, yeah. You know, it's... It, it, and, like, the, the IWOC actually helped organize prison workshops to go on strike, to do things like, you know, reestablish canteen balances so you can get a snack yeah. and basic things like that. Go Dude. on strike so you can have books without having to pay for them. Yeah. Fuck. Yeah. That's rad. Yeah. That's awesome. I think that yeah, uh, I mean, anyone fighting I for the rights of those people. I looking into IWAT. Yeah. I mean, ev- everybody, no, everybody has the right not to be a slave. Yeah, like, absolutely. and and our country's forgetting that. Our country's forgotten that. Um, so, I mean, if anybody's interested, I I'm I'm right there with you. I definitely recommend looking up the International Workers of the World. If you don't have if you don't have a branch in your area, you know, you can join and you know be your own branch, or you know, you can look you can look for other organizations too. There are. So many orgs out there that need your help. And I mean, this is a time where you, where they need it more than ever. I mean, you've, you've got the mess in Kenosha, you know, two, two fellow workers, you know, rest in power. They lost their lives to a white supremacist and another lost his arm. Um, I mean, it's dangerous out there and the, you know, these organizations, they need us, they need our help. I mean, unfortunately for me, like I've got these autoimmune issues that leave me immune compromised. I can't be out there right now, Yeah, but I can support in other ways. I can give material support. I can shelter. I can, there are other things that you can do without having to be out on the front line. Um, and you know, this is this sort of transition out of church and into, you know, leftist organizing, which I just see as community organizing. Yeah. Like, I mean, all these calls to defund the police or abolish the police, you know, think what you will about them. But if you could organize your community, so your neighbors watched out for each other, you're not going to need the police. Yeah. You're not going to be worried if they don't show up because you know, your neighbors got your back because you've got there. Um, like I, I feel like I have, you know, from where I was a decade ago to where I am now, like it's, it's night and day. Yeah. And sure. you know, you hear, well, and one of the things that like you hear about a lot is like, I mean, I remember when Greta Thunberg was all over the news and it's like, Oh, she's, she's on this jet flying across the ocean. And it's like, you know, yeah, that's the technology we have now, dude. Like, yeah. you can't expect her to teleport somewhere or walk somewhere. Yeah. And, I mean... Yeah, I hate that bullshit. Somebody, people people come at me all the time, and they're like, well, you make money. And it's like, yeah, motherfucker, because I got to pay for this house. Like, yeah. you, like, and yeah. I got to feed my fucking kids. Do you think, dude, like... Do you think I want to do this? Me Absolutely not. Dying is not going to further the cause. No, fuck no. Like, like I and, would, and dude, I make decisions all the time. Like I realized over quarantine, I was off work for two and a half months. I was like, I realized I don't have to make that much money. So, yeah. And I'm a barber, and it was like, which barbering's probably the most anarchist communist job you can have. You know, like, uh, <laughs> like I do my own shit, but I came back and I was like, yeah. I'm going to, I was working three 12 hour days and I was like, I'm just going to work three 10 hour days now and take a two hour lunch and go home and hang out with my fucking family because 
I'm paying my bills with what I got and I can still give money and hang out with people and like do shit like that. It's like, I don't need, like, I think we just get into this point where need, need, need. And it's like, you don't need that much, you know, like figure out what you need, figure out what you need to give and then fucking do that. Because if not, you're going to be a fucking, you're going to be a slave to, you know, like to capitalism. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, and I mean, and that this is where I kind of want to call out to people, you know, if, if you're listening to this and you feel like you're stuck in, and it doesn't even have to be a church. It can be any organization. If you feel like you're stuck somewhere and, you know, taking a huge leap isn't going to work. Don't take the huge leap. Take the small step, man. Just, take that tiny step. Um, like if, if I had tried to make a huge leap and just, you know, run, run out of the church, hands up screaming, I'm out of here. I either wouldn't have met my wife or Mm. I would have completely alienated her and, you know, wouldn't have that support that I've got right now. Like this, this is where my second verse for y'all is coming in always improve and remember that the electric light was invented by candlelight. You got to use what you have to get where you want to be. The electric light, we wouldn't have it if Edison wasn't, you know, well, one, if Edison hadn't stolen it from, uh, (laughs) yeah, Edison was a piece of shit. (laughs) He was, he really was. But you know, if if he and Nikola Tesla, you know, if they were like, you know, candlelight, I can't do it. I got to work by this new stuff. They never, you know, the technology wouldn't have been invented. So yeah. always improve. Don't compare yourself to the future. It's, it's yeah. a losing game. Yeah. Um, like you got to take those tiny steps. You got to work within what you have. Like, I mean, for people that, that are now in a situation similar to where I was, you know, if, if you're sitting around and, you know, you don't know where to start, Go to the church's website. There's a whole gospel topics essays section where they lay out. This is where we were wrong, man. This this was wrong. That was wrong. They don't say it quite that black and white, but they admit that, you know, blacks not having the priesthood was not good. They admit that there's, so you're familiar with the book of Mormon being a Mormon scripture. There are two other books. There's a doctrine and covenants and the pearl of great price. Uh, Doctrine and Covenants is Joseph Smith's revelation directly from God. Pearl of Great Price, a lot of it is what was called the Book of Abraham that Joseph also translated from a papyrus that he acquired. And it turns out that, you know, this Book of Abraham was actually, you know, instructions on how to embalm bodies. Uh Oh. And the church, yeah, yeah, it was, it was literally just, you know, technical documentation (laughs) from Egypt and the church has admitted, Hey, yeah, we were wrong about that. Oh my Um, God. That's awesome. So So he just, he just grabbed an Egyptian. He just grabbed an Egyptian like scripture that he thought and was like, this is what this means. And it was literally for embalming. Oh my God, that's hilarious! Yeah, what a it, fuck it up! Was, it was <laughs> what, a, what a fuck up, dude! <laughs> well, well, to his credit, they didn't have the internet back then. Like you yeah, couldn't research dude. that kind that's of thing. That's hilarious. So, you know, <laughs> he was such a fucking dude. If Joseph Smith wouldn't have like created like some weird religion and like wasn't racist and shit like that, if he was just like a good person, he would have been a rad con man. Like he was just running cons. You know what I mean? Like that dude could have fucking, he could have Robin hooded people if he was a good person. He, you know, he absolutely could have, he could have had a song by Woody Guthrie about him. Like pretty boy Floyd did that. He had to hoodwink a bunch of people and, you know, create a weird cult. Um, and you know, I, I use that term as playfully as I do seriously. Like, I mean, you look into some cult research and there, there are some definite uh, red flags, but yeah, yeah, like if if he would have used his talents for things other than hoodwinking people 
Like, he definitely could have been a Robin Hood or Pretty Boy Floyd and, you know, yeah. kept people out of foreclosure, you yeah. know? Maybe, <laughs> I mean, it, but, you know, the what about, you know, we're never going to know. And we just, I mean, going back to it, we just got to be better tomorrow than we were today. So, you know, what about yeah. it? Yeah. Eh, I don't know, but I know what I'm going to do. <laughs> <laughs> Hell yeah, man. Yeah, that's awesome, man. I, it's really cool to hear that um, through leaving this church, you were able to do the things that, I guess, aligned you. It allowed you to self-actualize. It allowed you to align yeah. your goals with your actions, and I think that's beautiful. Is there is there still a spiritual component to your morality and the things that make you feel satisfied, or is it a more just this is what's right on this earth now kind of thing. Yeah. So for that, I mean, I think you brought this up before uh, either both or y'all or one of y'all brought it up before that, you know, spirituality doesn't really die, but it can definitely shift. Like for me, I think it's got to do with sort of trying to get to that point of self actualization, like realizing who you are and how that connects you to the people around you and acting on that instinct instead of God's going to punish me. Like I, I feel more spiritual satisfaction from, you know, helping organize a march or helping feed somebody than I ever felt from, you know, knocking on a door and saying, Hey, I've got this church to tell you about. Like, yeah, yeah. I mean, you're. I, I feel like you're. I feel like it's really turned inward. Like, uh, I mean, part of the therapy that actually worked for me was um, DBT, uh, dialectical behavioral therapy, and a lot of that is uh, mindfulness meditation. Mm. Fuck yeah! So you got to spend a whole lot of time with yourself and kind of figuring out who you are and. Mm. I mean, I think a lot of people would benefit from turning their spiritual eyes kind of inward instead of outward. Yeah, I agree with that, man. Um, yeah, I think that I think that it's rad to like. Um, I don't know. You get to a place where I, I've said it before, but people are my religion. You know, like I believe I believe in them. Like I. I want to, I want to help as many people as we can. And, um, I want to continue to, um, I don't know, just give people a place where they can fucking discuss this shit and learn about it. And, um, I think that something that's awesome is knowing that, I don't know, you're out there and like, you're doing things for people. And every time you do something good for someone, there is a reaction. And like, I think that that's, you know, I don't know. It, I don't want to say it's karma, you know, but I do think that it's like, it's creating these like powerful moments in people's lives where they're willing to do the same for others when they have it, you know? Um, and I think that that's oh, why absolutely. things like communism, and, um, you know, socialism and stuff. It's like one, we all have rights to a roof, clothing and food. Um, but two, we all have like these rights to be, um, viewed as important, you know? Um, yeah. and I think that so often people, stop viewing those people as important, like the downtrodden and the poor and things like that. Um, so I don't know. I'm just really pumped that you're doing cool shit to yeah, be real. For sure. Um, I'm pumped that you're not a Republican anymore. <laughs> That's cool. Um, and, uh, I don't know. It's just been really good sitting down and talking to you and getting some word on, um, um, Mormonism and, uh, and leftist stuff because we haven't been able to talk a lot about that, you know, cause we're always like on religion <laughs> focus. But, um, yeah, I think that that shit jumps out from our scriptures we've added. <laughs> um, I hope so. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. absolutely so, it does. Um, 
Cool. And, you know, I just wanted to, you know, we've been running long. I just want to um, um, ask you if, you know, is there anything else like you want to plug? Is there anything you want to promote? Is there anything, you know, like last words? Last word, uh, I'll tell you what, last word is going to be a challenge for, I mean, both of y'all, I don't think you're going to have a problem with it, but anybody else listening to serve a stranger sometime in the next two weeks. Like yeah. if you see somebody struggling with something, offer them help. If, if you see a place where you can improve somebody's situation, minor as it could be or major, you know, whatever the case is, if it's just holding a door for somebody with an armful, just fucking do it. Just yeah. make somebody's situation better. Yeah. And put that energy out there in the world. Hell yeah, man. Yeah. Love it. Yeah. I'm down for that. Um, yeah. And then, you know, just to end, like, um, I think that I wanted to put out there, like, talking with some leftist shit like there's a lot of resources like if this is shit that you want to be into like food not bombs is always accepting like more people to help out um there's some good podcasts too uh one from columbus street fight radio i love those dudes um they're doing a lot of leftist stuff for um the podcast realm um Chapo Trap House has good takes, you know, things like that um, are good ways to. Antifada's got that stuff, yeah, man. I love um, the Antifada with Jamie Peck. And like, like that shit's, you know, I think that if our listeners are interested in finding out about left stuff and, uh, or think like, oh, yeah, maybe I am not a Democrat, you know what I mean? Like, like, <laughs> like, if you're thinking about taking that leap to the more, the further left, um, I think those are ways to really get involved is listening to Antifada, Street Fight, Chapo Trap House. And hit uh, us up. I'll and fucking, hit us up. I'll give you, you plenty know, of resources. Yeah. I'm, I'm actually going to wind back. I, I am going to plug one podcast because I know that, uh, you know, getting into left theory is really intimidating. There's a whole lot out there and it's pretty dense and dry. Yeah. There's a podcast out there called uh, The Red Minute, and the two the two co-hosts they literally break down writings by Lenin, writings by Luxembourg. Like they take these big, these oh, big yeah. intimidating, books and they do a quick overview, make it easy to understand. It's a great place to start. Sweet, yeah, The Red Menace. I'll put links to all those at the end here. Um, and then, you know, I mean, usually we ask for a verse, but you littered them throughout. So that's rad. Um, our last, you know, our last act is to throw our hands together and bow for you. You're a saint of chaos now, you know, and, uh, I'm really pumped for it, you know? Um, so I think that if anybody wants to learn more about Mormonism and shit like that, you know, uh, hit us up and we'll get a hold of um, Andrew and we'll talk to him and ask questions, forward questions. Oh, yeah. Hell yeah. Um, and you can do all of that on any social media platform except for TikTok because we don't check it. Uh, <laughs> but we have one if you want to follow us. But Facebook, uh, Instagram, Twitter, uh, Tome of Chaos podcast. And our Gmail is... Home of Chaos Podcast at Gmail. Yeah, there you go. Uh, it's the only internet you should use or email you should use now. Like, if you use Yahoo, like, come on. Yeah, I don't know what you're doing. I should I got, be. It's been a while. Yeah, I should be able to just say Tome of Chaos Podcast and you know that it's at Gmail. Um, also, it would be super rad if you could leave us a review um, on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Podbean. Wherever you listen, if they allow reviews, review us. If they, if you don't have a way to review us, take someone's iPhone, go to their podcast, search Tome of Chaos, and put a review. Please. Them, yeah. Um, because, dude, fucking what's his dick from Duck Dynasty's got to yeah. be fucking taken down. Yeah, we got to get past that guy. What's that dude's name? I don't know. I can't Fuck fucking guys, remember. Dude. Phil, Phil something. Phil Robertson. It's called Unashamed. 
his podcast is called fucking unashamed. And it's like, nah, dude, you should be ashamed. <laughs> like the, th- the shit you have said, like that dude, that dude, uh, referred to homosexuals, uh, uh, in the same vein as bestiality and shit. Yeah, like he is a piece that. of shit and he's like top rated podcast in our section. Yep. Um, it's making me sick. If we don't get more reviews, we're going to change what we're labeled under. Cause I'm tired of seeing that dude's dumb fucking face. <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, and yeah, so review us, send us messages. We love you all. Uh, this has been a great ride. Thanks for uh, continuing with the Toma Chaos. We'll see you all. We'll see all you Tomies on Tuesday next week. Fuck yeah. Later on. Peace.